Assalamu alaikum, greetings of peace. How are you guys doing? Guess what? I got some Edgewa dates. Have you ever heard of Edgewa dates? And I got the man next to me on the left. Thank you for the Edgewa dates. Assalamu alaikum. How you Welcome doing, Mr. Brown? My, my hi, how you been? Alhamdulillah. Thanks for the Edgewa dates. Yeah, my pleasure. So my people pleasure. don't know. Yeah, so how you been? Don't forget the Zamzam water, man. The, the Zamzam water, yes, <laughs> and the mis Miswaks. Yeah, there you go. You know, what are friends for? Thank you so much. How you been? Medina? Alhamdulillah. How are things in Medina? Uh, things are good. I haven't figured out a way to get younger, but uh, otherwise, doing okay. Good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, do you get a chance now? You know, the climate here, it's, uh, uh, is it reaching you, Trump, and all the politics? And does it reach that end of the world? Sure. And we're just kind of waiting to see how that works out. Yeah. So these are the kind of things that we're dealing with. You had, not too long ago, you had in Medina the holiest city in the world i think it was during the holiest month you were there you know what i'm talking about medina or mecca mecca no it, it was in yeah. medina no it was in medina the explosion that happened oh are you talking about during ramadan yeah during ramadan yeah um my understanding is i was fairly close to it when it happened yeah can you tell us because uh that's something we're dealing with here people always linking back daesh this extreme radical group and people who really don't know anything about Islam, but this is just, you know, to show like on the holiest month of the year during Ramadan, during the blessed month, you know, that in Medina, this was it a tribute. This group had actually what? What? Tell us what? What was a little bit because you were there, you live there. Tell us, uh, fill us in on what what happened. Uh, I mean, actually, uh, I was down at the Masjid al Nabawi when it happened, um, but. Quite frankly, aside from that, I really don't know the details except for what is in the news. Um, the other thing is, now I hate to kind of cop out on you here, but the bottom line is that I just am completely apolitical. I don't discuss you know, these issues. I don't make fatwa. And, um, and I, just, I just stick to my domain of interest, and some people say expertise, which is comparative religion and, uh, you know, the anti-atheist dawah. When we get to there, tell us for the people who are tuning in, a lot of times they get turned off because they keep associating, so I'll just hit you with this, the, uh, violence with Islam. And they can't get past that. So before we can even get to a lot of these commonalities and clearing these other misconceptions, comparative religion, some people keep thinking, nah, I don't want to eh, turn off these Muslims, they're all terrorists, you know, ISIS. They, what do you say about that? Sure. I mean, well, first of all, I mean, you will always have extremists. I mean, extremists exist in all religions, number one. Number two, uh, study on the acts of terrorism, the number of acts of terrorism, and the number of people who were killed from acts of terrorism in the United States over the past, I forget whatever number of years it was, but uh, Islam was not the top of the list. I mean, the top of the list were actually, if I remember correctly, it was, uh, now, I might be a little hazy on the details, but I think it was right-wing wing extremists, you know, basically, actually fundamentalist Christians. And, uh, and uh, you know, this is the thing that's just kind of annoying to us as Muslims, is that uh, any Muslim does anything and he's his religion is mentioned you know i mean he commits a any, any kind of a crime and it, it's like you know this muslim did that but you know any christian does anything yeah serial killing a, a schoolyard shooting uh you know anything like that and they put it in totally different terms they say oh he went postal or you know the guy was psychologically disturbed or whatever and they never mention the religion you know i mean when's the last time you ever heard, you know, Christian extremist, Christian terrorist, or something like this? Never. And uh, so there's, there does appear to be this, this strong bias in the media uh, to, I mean, I feel really to demonize Islam and to make Christianity just sort of sweep, sweep Christianity and Judaism's problems under the carpet. You know, you never, again, Buddhists, you never hear of Buddhist terrorists, but look at what's going on, Buddhist terrorism, but look at what's going on in, in Myanmar, and look, look what's going on with the, uh, you know, the genocide, the genocide that, that Buddhists are, are committing in, in the Far East, you know, and yet you never hear this as, you know, Buddhist terrorism. So, you know, there's, there's a attempt on the media to polarize things which i'm 
definitely not comfortable with. And it, it does seem grossly prejudicial. Yeah, we've, we've done, we've answered these questions on many previous episodes. We won't spend too much time on it. Go, go ahead, what were you going to say? Well, by the way, I do want to say something, and it is one of my sort of pet peeves, is that, uh, you know, I think all of this, I mean, I mean, not all, but, you know, 90-some percent, 95, 98 percent, really comes from 9-11. I mean, I was Muslim before 9-11, and I'm Muslim now, and, and uh, you know, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, but I saw the transition between how Americans thought and treated Muslims before 9-11 and after, and I really feel that was kind of the defining moment. Before 9-11, there was still some media bias. I mean, there was quite a lot of media bias, but then when 9-11 happened, it just ramped things up tremendously. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is one a pet peeve I have because number one, okay, if it was Muslims who carried out the atrocity of 9-11, it was a crime. The Muslim world recognizes it as a crime, and the Muslim world is trying to send this message to the West, to the developed countries, basically saying, look, this was a crime. Those are criminals. They don't represent our understanding of Islam, they don't understand our, I mean, they don't represent, you know, our values, they don't represent, represent our morality or our religious values, okay? So don't try to, to, to say that this is, you know, is Islam. This was the act of a criminal, no different from the act of a criminal of any other denomination or religion in the world. Okay, that's number one. But number two is, uh, you know, there's been this growing movement that questions. Brand new poll that show that more and more Americans are rethinking what happened on 9-11. And increasingly, more people are saying they do not believe the government's version of events. You know, questions where uh, or how 9-11 actually happened. 9-11. And candidly, wouldn't only fringe people still question what happened on 9-11? Well, perhaps not. Today, we're going to release to you results of a brand new poll that show that more and more Americans are rethinking what happened on 9-11. And, I mean, for example... So there are all kinds of reasons. We thought we were set up to fail. We got started late. We had a very short time frame. Indeed, we had to get it extended. Uh, we did not have enough money. They were, fa they were afraid we were going to hang somebody, that we would point the finger. Lee and I write in our book that um, we think the commission in many ways was set up to fail because we had um, not enough money, we didn't have enough time, we'd been appointed by the most partisan people in Washington. Um. There's an excellent, excellent expose on, um, on YouTube, or at least it used to be on YouTube, called 9-11 Mysteries, Demolitions. It's an hour and a half video you can watch or you can purchase. Uh, I think the last time I looked for it, you actually had to go to Amazon.com to buy it. I mean, the, just the best money you'll ever spend in researching this topic, okay? Mm -hmm. If you can watch that video and not have your convictions changed regarding how 9-11 happened, then you just kind of, you need to get an EEG, you know, an EEG, an electrocephalogram, something to check your brain waves. I mean, if you can watch that, that documentary and walk away with the conviction that, that you came in with, something's just wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so I just have to say that you know, th this is just the plug I've got, I've got to give, is stop demonizing not just Islam, but stop demonizing any group. We are living in a time and we are living in a culture that loves to hate or needs to hate, okay? I mean, as long as I have been alive and for a lot of time before, the West or the developed countries has always been demonizing a group. I mean, if it wasn't like the only good Indian is a dead Indian, you know, you, you, you come forward into World War II where, you know, the Germans were Krauts and then, you know, the Korean War where the, where the Koreans were the gooks and then, 
into the Vietnamese war where, the, you know, they weren't Vietnamese. No, no, they were Charlie or Slants or something like this, you know. And, you know, every different person is given a name that is is dehumanizing them. Okay, you're not, you know, you're not killing, you know, you're not killing a person. You're killing a kraut, World War Two. You know, you know, you're not killing a, a North Korean. You're killing a gook, you know, it's, you know, an ugly word. You know, you're not you're not killing a Vietnamese. You're killing a slant. I mean, where does this ugliness come from? But this is, it's a process of basically programming a people to see another people as, as something different from what they are. And every single time, every single time after the massacre, you know, after the dust settles, we turn around and we start realizing that we're rubbing shoulders with these people and they're okay. You know, the Indians that we massacred, the American Indians that we massacred, we now go and visit their, rev their reservations. We enjoy their art. We enjoy their food. We see the beauty of their customs and the gentleness of their natures. After World War II, the, you know, there are all these touching stories of soldiers who were united with their counterparts you know I mean, the the american you know the american uh, soldier who was uh, interned in a prison of war camp and uh, suffered horribly during his internment and da 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 and uh, later after the war is united with his captors and they both just realize we were we were on different sides of the equation and we're both okay you know or the one who was shot down by another pilot or or uh you know, was, you know, intimately involved in the struggle of life and death and the struggle of the war against another counterpart with which they were united later and, you know, later, and they just realized, you know, I mean, we're all human, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, the Germans in this country, the Japanese in this country, where'd they come from? The same countries that we were fighting. And what do we think about them now? I mean, I mean, sushi, you know, I, I mean, everybody knows, knows a Japanese person, if nothing else, just from our, our food culture. And, and, you know, we, we found that the people that we were killing before, we found that the people that we were fighting before on the basis of ideology, who we thought were less than human, they're okay. Yeah. After the Vietnam War, I mean, you couldn't go into a convenience store in America, except you had a high chance that you're going to be div doing business with the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And and they were okay. And what shock of shocks, you yeah. know? I mean, they're just like us. They they just want to live life and and you know, have a peaceful existence and so on and so forth. That's the the power of the human connection, huh? I'm just saying, look, I'm just saying whether, whether you're talking about the, you know, the forces that we were at war with in World War II, where, where you're talking about, you know, Mussolini's Italy uh, in, uh, you know, in that period, or whether you're talking about the, the, you know, the Nazi Germans, or whether you're talking about the Japanese. I'm talking about, the, you know, Koreans during the Korean War, the Vietnamese. Uh, it, it just doesn't matter what pool you look at. I mean, once you started, once these people were conquered and we found ourselves, you know, they immigrated and we found ourselves living next to them, we found all of our preconceptions dispelled. We found that we had been lied to. We found that we had been deceived. And we found that it was all for the purpose of an agenda that was beyond us. Okay? Mm -hmm. So when are we going to wake up? When are, when are we going to open our minds and recognize that we are being misled for a purpose, for an agenda? Good points. More to come with Dr. Lawrence Brown here in The Dean Show. Don't go anywhere. Please subscribe to The Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The Dean Show by making a donation in the link below. Back here on The Dean Show with my special friend, good friend, Dr. Lawrence Brown. Before I get to my next question, you brought up 9-11, and obviously that was a catalyst to where we are today. Have you heard of, it's interesting, these aren't just lay people, but somewhat around three thousand architects and engineers have cited evidence proving that the buildings were brought down in control of demolition. Thousand architects, engineers, scientists, 
politicians, former presidential candidates. It took some kind of consciousness raising on my part before I was willing to look at the, the possibilities. And really, you need to go where the evidence leads. As an engineer, and I have three degrees in engineering, I signed that petition for architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth some time ago because the American people absolutely need the truth of 9-11. Look at the evidence. In fact, I'll say this very categorically. Any reasonable person who looks at the evidence that's been brought forward has got to come away with the feeling that something has to be done, a real investigation has to be put forward. We're all demanding who signed a petition to reopen the investigation of 9-11. Have you heard of these uh, architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth? Oh, sure. And, you know, one of the things that I find very, very uh, striking about this is that is not only the collection of experts in their fields who are looking at the evidence, looking at the body of the evidence and saying, uh, you know, the official story, no, that just doesn't do it. I mean, that's... You know, we, we've got to re-examine this and, and uh, come to a more sensible conclusion. I mean, look, 9-11 did not, you know, the, the official story, it did not even answer how building number seven came down. Okay, uh, the greatest mystery of 9-11, how does a complete building come down? It wasn't, wasn't touched by the airplane, it wasn't hit by the airplanes. Okay, had a couple of minor little fires of it inside it from debris that, you know, uh, was scattered into it. And you just look at it, and just one moment it drops to the ground in the perfect picture of controlled demolitions, okay? Now, I'm, I'm just saying that I'm not the only one who's looked at that and just said, man, something's wrong. But you're just saying something's wrong. You're, you're, you're observing, you're, you're questioning, but now why is, it, why is it when you question, you're not making up some, some conspiracy, but they call you a conspiracy theorist. As soon as you question, like when you hear the firemen, they say, I Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if it had detonated. Yeah, it was detonated. If they were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. Look, it, it was a controlled demolition. You're just asking questions. You're not coming up with a theory. What happened? You're just asking questions. Why did they put you in this box? <laughs> conspiracy theorist. The definition of a conspiracy is when two or more people acting in concert knowingly commit an offense or a, or, or a crime. All right? A, a, a misdemeanor or a felony. An offense. That is the definition of a conspiracy. Was this a conspiracy? Absolutely. Yes, it was. And those people need to go to jail for treason. You can't even ask a question. Yeah, but... You're no. just supposed to accept what's been told to you. Accept this right. official story, mainstream, done. Right. Don't ask anymore. As I said, I had 32 years there, and I was also a trained fire marshal. A fire marshal is considered an expert witness in court. He's like a, a forensic detective. He has the power to administer the oath, take testimony, and issue a subpoena. That's a lot of power. It was, there was an explosion. The building did come down in complete classical uh, controlled demolition. It came down on its own footprint. There's no question about that. As a matter of fact, uh, Richard Gage from Architects and Engineers has completely handled that from his area of expertise. Never in the history of the world, never in the history of high-rise skyscrapers has ever a uh, skyscraper ever come down because of fire. And I'm talking massive fire, and you know the reason why? Because fire does not burn by itself hot enough to compromise and melt steel. What we had in the World Trade Center and I saw myself was molten lava-like pockets of molten steel. All right, I spent the night on the pile searching for bodies and I saw that with my own eyes. So who are you gonna believe? Are you gonna believe a bunch of government bureaucrats or my fellow brothers, which I lost 343 guys that day? Right, and, and, and you, you start talking like this and they say, oh, that's conspiratorial thinking, as if there's no such thing as conspiracy, as if conspiracy don't happen, conspiracies don't happen. You know, as, as if America does not have excites, did, did not commit black flag operations, did not have uh, 
what is it called, a, extraordinary rendition, you know, did not have the CIA with a box of dirty tricks overseas and so on and so forth. You know, I, I mean, just it's, just it's just a way of making you look bad or silent, silencing you for having an open mind. But one of the things that is most convincing to me is that is the body of, you know, the group of people who lost love, loved ones in 9-11 who are demanding a reinvestigation because they don't accept the family members. The official, yeah, the, the family members. I'm a family member trying to find out the answers to the murder of 3,000 plus people. The bottom line is that it needs to be investigated properly. Please look at architects and engineers, people all around the world, scientists all around the world are questioning this. And there's some deep, deep explaining to do. We will never heal. This country will never, ever, ever forget that day. We have to demand a new investigation. I want justice here. Because they don't accept the official explanation. And that many of them are the ones who are, you know, they are the ones who are saying that it was an inside job. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to say what my viewpoint on this is. I am just going to say that my message to people is don't close your mind, open your mind. And in the same way that we are asking for a re-examination of the evidence, people out there should re-examine the evidence themselves. Mm -hmm. So they should be listening to, I mean, you've, you've got eminent experts in their fields who are demanding a re-examination of the evidence. You have... As an engineer, I have three degrees in engineering. I signed that petition for architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth some time ago because the American people absolutely need the truth of 9-11. Uh, you know, really, really great documentaries like this one I mentioned, 9-11 Mysteries Demolitions. It's 9-11 Mysteries like slash demolitions, okay? Um, and uh, I, what's it going to take to watch it? You know, one of the things that I find really disturbing about this, though, is that 9-11 is like it's, it, people have views on it that approach the level of religious zeal. You know, when you talk about, when you talk about a religion or when you talk about religious views, a, a lot of people, it's just clear that their minds are closed and, and you just can't talk to them because if you say anything that is contrary to to their way of looking at things they they don't want to hear it it's like no 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 it can't be it can't be no 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 they, you know and then they express their view they keep repeating their view you know you know it's this way it's this way it's this way and, and you, you know um you know the, yeah the evidence points over here and uh, or you know or you know you point out the contradictions to them or you point out how they're basically you know not following the path of logic or you know they're not many times they're not even following the teachings of their own book you know, and when it comes to 9-11, it's the same way. They just say, no, 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 no. As, you know, it's like the, you know, the three monkeys with their hands <laughs> over their eyes, ears, and, and uh, what is it now? Eyes, ears, and mouth. Yeah. You know, except, except they, I, I wish they would put their hand over their mouth, but they don't. That's the that's yeah. one hand they keep away. They keep talking, but with their eyes closed and their ears closed, just kind of, no, 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 Muslims are bad. No, this was Islamic terrorism. No, no, no. You know, I, I, you know, and, and they're not willing to examine the evidence and consider the possibility that this is all the part of a greater agenda. And, but, but at the very least, just consider the possibility that, like I said, Muslims and Islam is not, you know, is not as bad as how it's being portrayed. Why is our news media foaming at the mouth when it comes to stories about Islamic terrorists, but not white guy terrorists? It's not because Muslims are a bigger threat. In fact, between 1980 and 2005, 94% of all the attempted or successful terrorist attacks on U.S. soil were not carried out by Islamic radicals, but instead by non-Muslims, mostly white guys. So then why the obsession? Islam prohibits killing of innocent human beings. Human life is precious. In this country. Do they blow people up? Every yes, oh, uh, Christians every day. People walk into post office. I mean, uh, people walk into post offices. 
They walk into schools. That's what Columbine is. I mean, I could do this all day long. There's so, there are so many more examples of Christians, and I happen to be a Christian. That's back to this notion of your idealizing Christianity in my mind, to my read. There's so many more examples, Ayan, of Christians who do that than you could ever give me examples of Muslims who have done that inside this country where you live and work. You know? But we, we can say clearly, we can close the door that Islam has nothing doesn't justify acts like this even at the end of the day if some crazy deranged individual or group of individuals went and killed innocent people which by the way muslims uh, hundreds have died in this this has nothing to do with islam islam condemns this there is no justification for it this is clear this is something that there's no shadow of a doubt about that now we're talking about even questioning it further but it seems like this is something that is a tool that's used to demonize the whole way of life of Islam. Well, as I said, I mean, you've heard my viewpoint. First of all, I just I, I want to correct myself on something. I said, you know, as something about how, um, you know, people should conclude that Islam is not, not as bad as it's being portrayed. I, I mean, actually, for myself as Muslim, I have to just say that, you know, I would hope people would conclude that, that Islam is not bad, period. You know, I mean, the more... The more you examine Islam, you know, and anybody I've known who's examined Islam with an open mind, it just starts to understand, start to realize that everything's upside down. Everything is the opposite of how, how they were trained to believe. You know, that it's actually a, it's, it's a beautiful religion. It is consistent with the continuity and the chain of revelation from the previous prophets. It clarifies previous revelation, and it brings us to a conclusion of the chain of revelation from the Abra from Abraham to Ishmael and Isaac to Moses to Jesus to Muhammad you know there is there's a chain of revelation there and if you you know if you are on a spiritual spiritual search and looking for the completion of revelation you have to look for what you have to look for the three prophets that the old testament uh, predicted John the Baptist and Jesus Christ are one and two. And then you have to look for the final prophet, the third and final prophet that was predicted, not only in the Old Testament, but also in the words of Jesus, predicting a third prophet who would come and another paraclete, you know, who would basically clarify. Okay, and, and that third prophet is the prophet Muhammad. So now I'm just, I'm just saying, okay, I'm just saying that, you know, Islam is a religion that more people you know, who open in their hearts and open their minds and look at it from an open perspective, just feel that they've been lied to. You know, they, they say, you know, I always, these, I always thought these people were bad. I always thought this was, religion was bad. But, but you know, it, I mean, actually, there's so much beauty here. And this, is, and this conforms with what I already believed. And this conforms with, you know, the, the revelation that, you know, I studied before. And, uh, and, and this clarifies it, and, and now I understand. So, I'm, you know, look, I'm just, you, you know, we, we live in a funny time. Mm -hmm. people, people need the, to get their information in postcard format. You know, if you can't fit it into, what is it, 140-some characters in a twit, you know, I mean, if you, if, you can't, if you can't twit it, uh, if, if you can't, if you can't uh, encapsulate it in a very, very brief message that conforms to people's sort of shortened attention span in this time. Yeah. It's very hard for people to to engage in the in an intellectual what, debate. What what about you? There was a gentleman and there's a lot of cases like this <laughs> where they get fed a lot of this false information, false fears that oh you're going over to Jeddah or you're going over to that side of the world. You actually live in that so you were a former uh, major in the uh, US Navy, is that right? Air Force. Air Force, I'm sorry. And, and you, you've you been living over, you accepted this uh, way of life, you used to be an atheist, trying hard to be a, a Christian. We have your story from the past. But many people who've been fed these lies, they actually go over there and they experience the love and hospitality. You must have experienced it because you've been living there for how long now? And tell us about this, your Se experiences there. 17 years. And by the way, my, my daughter off camera is showing me a little sign saying, it's not a twit, you twit, it's a tweet. <laughs> so... <laughs> But that shows that shows you how much attention I give to social media. I, I feel social media is not is not the pathway to intelligent discourse. It's uh, you know social media gives you a postcard version at best 
for people with extremely shortened attention spans. I mean, if, I mean, come on, if you're going to engage in the debate, if you are going to hang your afterlife on this, you really cannot take the time to read a book. You really cannot take the time to, you know, to uh, investigate in a serious way. I mean, this is your afterlife. You've got, you've got 70 years to figure it out, but you, or 60 years or 80 years or for some people, you know, they die even younger, but, but it, this is going to be your eternity. And you cannot devote a little time for it. You, you can't give up on a movie one night or a TV show the next or whatever to, to actually cram for the final exam. Yeah, I mean, come on, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that's what you die upon, uh, <laughs> you almost kind of deserve it mm. because you've been ignoring the one who created you and put you on this earth for the purpose of knowing him and serving and worshiping him. Mm -hmm. You know, and you've just totally ignored it. You've just blown it off. It's mm -hmm. like, Playing Xbox your whole life. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just, it's ungrateful. It's ungrateful mm -hmm. and it's irresponsible. Yeah. Now your experience, how you've, you've been living there. Have you, This gentleman, one in particular, I forgot his name. They had him on, I think, Huda TV, an American Christian. And he was told, like, these guys are going to, if you go over there, you might, you know, have your head cut off. Oh, yeah. And then he, he goes there and again, he said, man, they were so hospitable, loving. And he actually... He was a God-fearing Christian. He said, you know, God, he basically, in, in, in summary, was asking, just guide me, God, whatever, you know, to the truth. And he ended up accepting Islam. We'll show a little clip here. My friends at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, they said, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> you're putting yourself in harm's way. You're going to get kidnapped. Somebody's going to cut your throat. <laughs> so when I arrived in Saudi Arabia, I was scared to death. Um, I didn't know quite what to expect. But I, when I left the United States, I said, God, uh, my mind is open. I don't know what is Islam. I've never been in an Islamic country before. And I don't know about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But show me what is truth and what is not truth. And uh, I came with an open mind. And I'm looking, looking, nothing happened. People were coming out of their houses when they saw me. <laughs> Inviting me into their homes for tea and coffee. SubhanAllah, the exact opposite. Incredible. Mm. This was not what I expected. Wow. I had been in countries all over the world. I studied in Taiwan and Russia and different places. But never in my life have I been in any country that respected me as much as an American and even as a Christian as Saudi Arabia. Grace and mercy, forgiveness of sins. Wow. My life was transformed immediately it was the love of god and the love of the muslims around me that drew me to islam now you're there you're living there i mean is this uh, tell us a little bit about this uh, when people do go down there when they get out of their neighborhood and they, they get out to other parts of the world yeah how uh, fictitious this is i mean just completely i've been living in the middle east for 17 years when i went over there uh, people gave me these warnings about, you know, you know, watch yourself, it's dangerous, the people don't like this, this might happen, that might happen. Now, I've lived there before 9-11. I was in Medina when 9-11 happened, and uh, I've lived there ever since, okay? And I have never had anything except for, for, you know, basically the best of treatment. Well, I shouldn't say never. There's always, you know, a few isolated incidents as of, you know, the same as you'd have here on the street in America where, you know, you just you know don't hit it off with somebody but but i mean i've just i've just had the best of a treatment i mean i remember after 9 11 after 9 11 i just remember all of these saudis coming up to me and apologizing and just you know very sincerely saying we're so sorry for what happened to your country and i mean it's not their fault these are these these are are, are beautiful polite well-mannered people you know uh, once you're in their presence, you feel their gentleness. You they weren't dancing in the streets. I heard the common mantra is that when this happened, people no. were dancing and celebrating. No, that's ridiculous. I mean, I I never saw that, and I was. Have I, you heard this cliche? Have you heard this? No, actually, I haven't. Yeah. But but you know, I mean, I I did not see any of that, and I didn't. I haven't talked with anybody who did, and I was living there. Okay, and I'm in Medina, one of the holy cities. If you, if you expect to see that anywhere, if that were the manner of the people, you would expect to have seen that there. But yeah. I, I did not have people do, you know, do anything but apologize to me and say, you know, we're really sad that this happened. 
and and you know telling me as a muslim telling me you know that this is not part of our religion i said yeah i know that and they said you know you know we're no you know we're against this and i said yes of course uh, of course i know we're against this and and so on but uh, you know aside i mean aside from that just in general i have to say the propaganda that i have been aware of is always from what i've seen it's just always contrary to the truth i mean why have I been in Saudi Arabia for 17 years? I mean, these these people have extended their arm of hospitality towards me in their country, and they have given me a beautiful life there. Mm-hmm. I, I feel safer in Saudi Arabia walking, walking down a, a small alley, which, by the way, I do all the time going to prayer, you know, in the morning, sometimes three in the morning, sometimes four in the morning. I feel I feel safer walking down a small dark unlit alley, right at three or four in the morning, than I do sometimes uh, just in open daylight here in America. You know the 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 incidence of crime is so low. The and it's just basic values. You know that the Arabs have this very high respect for honesty, for generosity, for hospitality. You know, and they try to excel at these things. You know, they, they you know, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the teachings when you go into an Arab household in the Middle East. Don't look at anything. Because if you allow your eyes to al- alight on something in the room and the host notices, they'll just take that thing and give it to you. I mean, it might even be something very valuable. I, I remember one time... Uh, you know, when I was fairly new in Medina, uh, I just, I saw this rug in this guy's house. Very beautiful, well, handmade, hand knotted rug. I mean, I, I would estimate its value would be in the, you know, maybe around five, six thousand dollars, you know, small knots. And I mean, I mean, just a beautiful handmade, uh, you know, carpet. And uh, the guy just saw me looking at it and that was it. He had to give it to me. Now, this, this doesn't go so, after him being an Arab. This is because <clears throat> of the teachings that the Almighty sent from Islam, correct? This is where do they get this now? This is. This um, I think it's a combination because, like, even, even, even before the religion of Islam, there, you know, there was this extreme, extremely generous uh, Arab named, uh, I think it was Hatim, if I remember correctly. And so they even have this, you know, this saying to be as generous as Hatem because yeah. he, he set this example for uh, generosity. But, you know, I mean, go back to go back to Abraham and that time where, you know, a, a guest would arrive, an unknown guest, and you would just slaughter the fatted calf. Uh, there are beautiful people. And I think part of, you know, part of that is uh, just innate. There are mm-hmm. beautiful, generous people. What if someone says, look, oh, you're a sellout now, you know, like for myself, oh. I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a, oh, he's an Arab now. No, no, you can't obviously change your DNA, your nationality. Look, I, I'm an American. I love my country. But at the same time, I'm conscious of my purpose in life. I love my creator. I, I live this beautiful way of life. But I also respect other people's cultures. I'm open to learn. But if someone, you know, uh, says something like this, oh, now you're you, you sell out. You know, look, you hear all sorts of ignorant things. First of all, <laughs> yeah. First of all, stop listening to me, okay? I mean, go listen to all the other non-Muslims, okay? Non-Muslims who have come to the Middle East and found themselves, you know, welcomed and well treated by well-mannered, generous, hospitable people. My life was transformed immediately. It was the love of God and the love of the Muslims around me that drew me to Islam. Okay, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, you know, be convinced by them. Don't be convinced by me. I've known so many people like this that they're just, you know, uh, they're non-Muslims, but they don't want to leave the Middle East. Yeah. And some of them leave the Middle East in tears because, you know, their their job has, you know, their contract has ended, their job yeah. has run out or something like that. I mean, some of them leave the Middle East in tears because they don't want to leave this beautiful environment that they found. Now, let me just back up for a minute. Please understand, okay, I'm not trying to completely... Uh, you know, com- completely, uh, how do you say it? I mean, make things look, you know, completely rosy, all right? Because uh, there are good and bad people everywhere, okay? So I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, these people are bad, these people are good, this place is bad, that place is good. No, there are good and bad people everywhere. But it's on 
a spectrum. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what I can say is, what I can say is that I, I feel so happy and so comfortable in, in the presence of the brothers and sisters who welcome me into their homes and into their country in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. I never want to leave. Yeah. I love these people. When my, my patients, you know, the, the Arab patients I have, I love these people. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a privilege to me. It's, it's not just a job. It is a privilege to me that Allah has put me in a position where I can treat these people and be an agent through which they regain their eyesight. Mm -hmm. Okay, an agent because all good things are from Allah, but okay, I'm, I'm an agent through which this happens. And it's a privilege to me that, you know, the powers that be in, in Saudi Arabia have accepted me as a guest into their country and, and honors me in that position. Yeah, uh, we've got a few more minutes. I want to touch upon uh, a few other things. I mean, that's, that's the power of the human connection, not just closing yourself off from other cultures, other ways of life and going beyond what you've been brainwashed to believe and this is a testimony of many testimony of other people who've experienced again that love that compassion and, and this is what we should be working towards you know uh, growing is humanity tell us there's a professor here in chicago dr pape who said since we're on this topic he said that this is an expert a terrorism expert he evaluated a thousand plus terrorist acts and he said this is not some just random individual, an expert. He says Islam has little to nothing to do with these terrorist attacks. This is all politically motivated. Have you heard of Dr. Pape and this uh, analysis, the study that he did? Uh, I haven't because I work in a different field, as I said. my And before 9-11, and before you didn't have, if you go back, you didn't have these groups as, such as Al-Qaeda, Daesh, ISIS, all of these things, because we're trying to find out the root, where these things come from. It's not like Islam is inherently bad and it's calling you to go ahead and strap bombs, but you have extreme elements. These he's talking about, these are politically motivated. Yeah, I mean, I haven't heard of him or these, uh, you know, these conclusions, but it doesn't surprise me because, uh, you know, I think I'm just guessing, but I'm guessing that what he is trying to say is basically that Islam is not associated with terrorism because we know that the Islamic beliefs are not consistent with these acts. Now, yes. there may be Muslims, there may be Muslims who have committed acts of terrorism in the same way that there are Muslims who may have committed crimes and, you know, Christians and Jews and atheists and everybody else. Okay, there are good and bad people everywhere. All right, but I mean, we're talking about a religion of what 1.2, 1.3 billion people. I mean, a huge portion of the uh, population of this earth. So you can't expect, you know, all of them to be uh, peaceful, law-abiding citizens. You'll find some criminals in that mix. Yeah. All right, but so what he's really saying is that you might have some criminal Muslims, but those people don't speak for the religion. Stop demonizing the religion. Stop marginalizing the religion for the acts of the few. I mean, if you if you look at okay, let's let's say that there were twenty two Muslim terrorists who carried out nine eleven, and that's a big that's a big you know uh, presumption. But let's say that there were. What is twenty two out of one point three billion? Why aren't you looking at the one point three billion and not looking at the twenty two in the same way that you look at Christian America? Okay, you look at, uh, well, <laughs> I almost hate to say Christian America anymore because the number of Christians is waning and those, you know, those who are Christian are very often, you know, sort of marginal Christians. Uh, but in any case, you know, you look at Christian in America, Christian America and they don't accept for their religion to be demonized when there's found to be a Christian serial killer or a Christian who goes postal and, you know, commits an, uh, you know, that happens daily or the KKK attributing the whole religion to the KKK Christian, that sect. That's e obvious to, to see, I don't distinguish even, the two. I don't even know if the KKK is still active. They're okay? active. They have but two, almost 200 live branches right now. You can go sign up right now. If you wanted, they have websites. They're ready to hire and fire 
and they're in fully functional. What do you mean by fire? <laughs> Kick you out if, they, if if you if you no. if you dis if you disengage yeah. from those extreme radical beliefs, you probably get kicked out. You're going to uh, get fired. <laughs> okay, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. So in any case, I mean, you know, I'm I'm just you know I'm just saying that uh, you know you shouldn't demonize the religion for the acts of a few. And I think this this man that you're talking about is probably just just saying. You know, differentiate between Muslims and Islam. Yeah. Okay. You might find some bad Muslims. You know, you might find some Muslims that can conduct acts of terrorism. But if that's not consistent with the religion of Islam, if that if that is not from the Islamic teachings, then Islam's not responsible for that. These guys are. These bad guys are. But the religion is not. Yeah. Give us a tweet. Give us something to end with. We got it. We're out of time. Give us something for the person tuning in. They're watching us, and they don't know much about Muslims, Islam. They're hearing this stuff for the first time. They're seeing you, white Caucasian. What are your eyes, green or blue? What's that? And they're like, okay, you know, this is interesting. You got to get out there. You got to get out there. You got to look. One thing I wanted to say is a lot of the Muslims, not a lot, almost all, almost all of the Muslims I've ever met. And I've been, I've traveled to Jordan, Kuwait, Bahrain, um, of course, Saudi Arabia, uh, Palestine, Israel, uh, and uh, Turkey, and uh, I mean a number of number of countries in the Middle East. Okay, and everybody I have ever met is frustrated, 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 and they're always saying the same thing. They're saying, "Why did you know? Why did the West see us like this? You know, I mean, this is this is not who we, we're. You know." we're okay and if people actually went and lived with them they'd find out that that's true they'd find out that these people are you know they're calm they're peaceful they're loving they are like i said they're hospitable they're generous and this has to come from somewhere and and yeah part of it is their nature and part of it is their their religion fine-tuning their nature okay of course you know that that's just i mean those are the moral constraints that they live within also from the religion. Mm. But it's a beautiful thing and you have to experience it to understand. It. The other thing I'd say is check out my website, leveltruth.com. Leveltruth.com? Leveltruth.com. It's got a lot of material. If you if you are on a spiritual search, as I was saying, read a book, start with mine. Mm -hmm. I mean, start start with the first and final commandment. Or start with misguided. And don't think I'm trying to sell anything. Go to the website. Download it free of charge. It's all there on, on PDF downloads. You don't need to pay a cent. Okay, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't care. Just just read. Thank you for the Zemzem and the Edgewood dates and the Miswak. <laughs> My pleasure. Always a pleasure. Make sure you stop in next time you're in town as always. And thank you guys. Walk with a Muslim. Talk with a Muslim. Visit a mosque. Call us 1-800-662-ISLAM. Make the human connection. And visit me here every week. Visit us here at the deanshow.com. Like us on, what is that, Facebook, follow me on Twitter, stay up to date with The Dean Show. We started with peace, we end with peace, Salam alaikum, peace be with you.